do you expect to be the All Blacks coach against Argentina? I've got no idea. I just want everyone to know that we got us back, all the players have got us back. Well, after weeks of speculation and doubt, Ian Foster is keeping his job as head All Blacks coach. There's a few things that we could have done better in the in most recent weeks. They've come out and, and uh, aired all their dirty washing in the front part of the uh, property, rather out the back. So, you know, the relationship between the board and the exec uh, with the players at the moment is probably the worst it's ever been. New Zealand rugby themselves admitted there were some mistakes. I just hope it never plays out like this again. New Zealand Rugby is now commencing a process for selecting the All Blacks head coach from 2024. This will be concluded in the next four to six weeks. Ian Foster has this afternoon dropped a bombshell on his future, ruling himself out of the running to coach the All Blacks beyond this year's World Cup. Well, New Zealand Rugby are probably just letting things hang at the moment. There's probably not much support. Or Fozzie probably doesn't feel like there's much support for him. Uh, a lot of people... Uh, feel for how things have been drawn out in public. Sort of sense that post-World Cup makes a lot of sense, but um, this is the, the route they've gone. I think the way it's been dealt with at the moment, there's distractions everywhere. Neither timing window is perfect. From my point of view, I think Razor is the next all that coach. Um, you, know, it's probably, you know, it's probably what should be happening. How many, how many times, how many times have I heard distraction? Think about Ian Foster, though, one game away from getting the sack six months ago. Now all the discussion, before or after. But distraction comes from indecision, and the NZR have made that decision. The most important thing for us is to get behind Ian Foster and this All Black team to win the World Cup. Now, Fozzie's temp time at the top is over. Well, not quite. Six months away. But... We're going to be talking about who's going to be the new coach. Is it a one-horse race? Is it Razor? Is Jamie Joseph applying? Or, as the NZR said, they want to open the net? I don't think so. I reckon Razor gets it. But, question for you at home. Can Razor work with Jamie? Hmm, interesting one. Lots to talk about. So, distracted? <laughs> I'm always distracted. <laughs> Now I feel distracted and confused as well. Tēnā koutou katoa, good evening and welcome into the breakdown. Great to have you joining us tonight as we dissect Super Round in Melbourne. Adi Savia turned heads for all the right or wrong reasons. We'll let you decide a little bit later on. And as Sir John Kerwin said, in the next four to six weeks, we will have a new All Blacks coach from next year onwards. Joining us to dissect it, debate all the action, Sir John Kerwin, you're back for another week, plus Tony Johnson and Stephen Bates join us on the panel. Thank you so much, gentlemen, for coming in. Did you find it a surprise that Ian Foster has not put his hat in the ring to be the next All Blacks coach, JK? Uh, not at all. I think that behind closed doors, TJ, probably what happened was uh, Fozzie got the feeling that the NZR wanted change. I think the biggest problem that everyone has to ask themselves is, do you want to go now or later? They've made that decision. Um, and if Fozzie had a stood, it would have been a hiding to nothing for me. So he's probably made the right decision. He can now concentrate on the World Cup. And, and if he wins, he's going to be a pretty happy man. Yeah, yeah, there is a sense that he's almost been hounded into making this um, position about you know, not carrying on after the World Cup. I think the thing that gets me is, is that Nothing about this reflects well on New Zealand rugby. You look from the leadership of the game for clarity and for a strong sense of direction, and we haven't had that. We've had confusion, we've had speculation, and certainly a lack of clarity about it all. And I think the thing that bothers me the most about it is that this is World Cup year. And, and whether we or you at home or anyone thinks or doesn't think that Ian Foster is or ever was the best man for the job, the point is, he is the coach going through to the World Cup and all of this carry-on is not doing him any favours at all in doing the job of trying to bring home another World Cup to New Zealand. To answer your question, Kirst, does it surprise me? No, it doesn't. And the, the reason why it doesn't surprise me is because what if he put his name in the hat to get the job and then didn't get it? 
You know what I mean? Then that just creates a whole lot of doubt and, oh, we're going to the World Cup, but we don't have the right man, do we? So now this is what happens. He's he's withdrawn from it. He's got six months in the job and we're certainty on that he's got that time. He works off to the World Cup and hopefully for himself and also for us as a public, he goes out and wins the World Cup and then he walks away a happy man. And don't forget there's a human element to it. So good luck, Fozzie. Get stuck in. Get the job done. You'll make plenty of people happy. Or... Do we just need to get over ourselves because this is the way professional sport is? Mm. At, the reality is, if you're in football, then, you know, when you're in Italy, they say he's not going to make Christmas if you start to lose. We've just seen Eddie Jones lose his job. We've seen Pivac lose his job. I mean, is this just the way it's going to happen now? So for me, we maybe need to start thinking about, OK, why are we making these decisions? Are we going to sack... Are we going to see the first All Black coach sacked? if it doesn't work out. I mean, it's a pretty nervous place to be. I think New Zealand rugby are in a bit of a damned if they do, damned if they don't situation regarding uh, make the timing of the appointment because I think, as has been pointed out, they, they didn't want to lose potential candidates by going late. That happened to them last time. To me, that's not such an urgent need following the two jobs of England and Australia. They were key... Um, dominoes, if you like, and this domino effect that they foresaw of, of perhaps some of the contenders for the All Black jobs being taken elsewhere. Those jobs are being filled now, so I would question whether there was the need to go early, but they've made that decision, and I guess in that, what is it, that four to six weeks, as the chairman said, or chairperson said, um, we'll, we'll know. Well, shortly we're going to discuss who could be putting their hat into this ring, the head coaching candidates and the teams that could potentially come with them as well. But first, a man who has been there, done that. He's been the head coach of the All Blacks before in a similar situation. John Hart is with Jeff Wilson. Well, New Zealand Rugby have announced the process has started to find the next all Black head coach. Why not talk to someone who's been there and done that? John Hart, you're a former All Black coach. When you think about what's happened over the last year, in regards to the players, do you think in any way that might affect their performance this season? Well, I think there's been a lot of talk about that, and I think it's rhetoric. I think my, my own view is that the players are totally focused on what's ahead of them right now, Super Rugby, then the international season, then the uh, World Cup, obviously, is the, the showpiece of the year. Um, I have no uh, doubt that that's where they are focused. They won't be thinking about next year. Though a lot of them have already made their choice about next year. Um, but So I don't see any problem with player focus going into this international season. This is a new era of New Zealand rugby. And you think about it, it's a new head coach for the All Blacks. What do you think New Zealand rugby might be or should be looking for? Well, I think they'll look for someone who can lead them into a new era. I mean, this uh, era from, um, if you have a look back to, uh, through um, Steve Hansen, through um, Graham Henry, even through um, Ian Foster, you've had continuity. I think there's going to be a break with that continuity, so they'll be looking for someone else who can come in, lead, do some things differently, and hopefully um, you know, create the environment that the All Blacks uh, can go on and go back to where we want them to be, number one in the world. Do you think this is going to be a close race between, it appears as there are two camps, two very strong camps. How thorough do you think this process is going to be? I have no doubt this process will be done well. I think New Zealand Union uh, are absolutely committed to getting the best option. And I personally think there are two good options. And uh, I think, um, you know, the interview process will be an important part uh, of what the, each, each party can bring, what their teams will be, who are the people that they're likely to want as part of it. Um, but I think we're really lucky we've got two choices. John, just lastly, you've seen the talent and, and you're in part of the Blues organisation. You know what we've got here in New Zealand rugby. On the 29th of October this year, the Wear Ballast Trophy is going to be lifted. Do you think we've got enough time and this group of players and coaches can get across the finish line and maybe lift that trophy? I have no doubt we've got the time. I think... Um, you know, we made strides last year. No, not everyone will be happy with where we were last year, but I think the introduction of uh, Jason Ryan and, and uh, Joe Smith has been substantial, and I think the team will be very well prepared going into the World Cup. And I think, yes, we've got depth. I'm really excited by what I'm seeing already in Super Rugby. Some of the All Blacks really firing. So I'm excited about the potential, and I think we are a real chance. Thanks, John. Thank you. Great to get the thoughts of John Hart and Jeff Wilson. We'll be back on the panel next week as well. But there's so many questions about this appointment process. Is it an open process? Have candidates been shoulder tapped already? JK, is this a one horse race for you? Is this Scott Robertson's job? No, I don't think it is. My personal opinion is I believe he's committed to New Zealand rugby, stayed here, won six titles. I think he is an amazing leader of a new generation of players. I think you'll get a good group around him. So 
I think it's a pretty good choice. If he got it, I'd be absolutely stoked. What do you need when you're selecting, though? If you're the NZR, what do you want? You want the best candidates. Um, and I think Jamie Joseph is also a really good candidate. I also jo I think Joe Smith might be someone that might think, oh, OK, although he said he wouldn't coach again, he is also a very, very good candidate. And that's maybe someone you'd go to and say, listen, Joe, you should think about it. Because the more options you've got, the better. But for me, um, all the stats, all you look at, maybe they just go straight to saying, if you're going to commit to New Zealand rugby and prove by winning Super Rugby, it's enough. In the past, I've always wanted someone with international experience, and that's the one thing that Scott Robertson doesn't have. So to appoint him would be a bit of a break from tradition. Look, I think uh, the thing about Jamie Joseph is that he brings Tony Brown with him, an innovative thinker, but then uh, Razor would bring with him Jason Ryan, who's already been part of the setup there. Joe Smith's role, I'm not sure that he's interested in the head coaching role. I think he's been a, a valuable addition uh, to the setup. I'd love to see him stay there. But it really depends on who gets the job, whether or not they can work with him. So to me, the teams that they bring the, around them is also extremely important here. Yeah, I, I agree. It's not just the individual, it's the team that they bring with them and who can put the team. So we know if Jamie, Tony will be with them as well. So that's a good team. Um, also, I think I'll just pick up on your point, JK, is international spirit, uh, experience crucial? Now, I think if you're current in the game and you know how to coach rugby and you know how to coach players and you know how to set up a game plan and you know how to um, pull apart another team's game plan, as long as you're relevant in that space there at a high level, I think that's good enough. Mm. You know what I mean? And And... Be it Jamie in, in Japan, be it Joe, done it for years and years, be it Razor in, um, down in Christchurch there, or someone else. If you've got those skills and bring a team together, I think that's enough in my opinion. Well, let's take a look at the international and domestic achievements from these three potential head coaching candidates that we've seen, Joe Schmidt, Scott Robertson, Jamie Joseph. This isn't to say that a smokey could come out of the woodwork, mm. but if you look at this, TJ, who are their teams? Who are these teams you're talking about? Does it matter? That's what I want to ask. Does it matter? Oh, I think it does matters it, a lot. Does that matter? Oh, oh, oh well, you mean what? You, those stats? Yeah, or, so or about who they bring? No, no. Who they bring, I think, matters. But if you're, if you're going there, TJ, and you sit down, yeah. does it really matter that Razor doesn't have international? I don't think it does anymore. Yeah, all I was saying was that that has been a rule of thumb up until now. Maybe it is time to make a break with tradition, do something a little bit more. I have no doubt at, at the moment that, that Scott Robertson is the, has the inside running for this job. Um, and you're hearing some stories about who might be involved with them. It's, it's, it's quite interesting, um, but because they haven't put their hands up and made it official, well, I don't, I don't, I don't think we'll get into that. But to me, he, he, yeah, he, I, just, but I still think they have to have a very open and transparent process, and, and it's really important who makes the decision. Are we going to have a, a board of um, a, a advisors, a panel? Or is it just going to be the board that rubber stamps it? Why do we not have the answer to these questions? When there was a press conference the other day, JK, we're still oh, asking well, these questions. I think we should just go and ask. Pretty simple. Mm. Lots of questions and not a whole lot of answers at the moment. But Australia have done this in recent months, haven't they? They have brought in a new coach. Eddie Jones will be at the helm for the Rugby World Cup and beyond. He's been in Melbourne watching the action of Super Round and we put all the hard questions to him. Look, I think I heard John Kerwin speak on a, a breakdown and, uh, you know, I admire JK. He's been in the game a long time and he said, you know, it's not preferable, but it's the way sport is at the moment. People want change quickly. You know, people aren't prepared to wait. You know, we've seen the situation with, with you know, I've been part of England, Wales, or England, England uh, being sacked. Uh, Wales sacked their coach. Australia sacked their coach. Um, it's not great, no one likes it, but I think that the change in coaches and the need to, to step forward quickly is inevitable in the way that life is at the moment. So definitely not preferable, not nice, um, but probably the way it's going to go. Uh, I saw Kieran Reid speak about it and I think he's 100% right, that players move on quite quickly. Initially there'll be, there'll be some some discussion about it, but as soon as they get in the camp and they're focusing on firstly the Rugby Championship, then the Bledisloe Cup and the World Cup, all that distraction will go and they'll be 100% behind Fozzie, as, as the players have been, I think, through, throughout his tenure. I'm not the person to ask for that. You know, I think 
The, the great thing about New Zealand rugby, and we've seen that over the last 20 years, is the number of good coaches they produce. So there will be a number of good coaches there in New Zealand to select from. Some of them are in New Zealand at the moment, some of them will be coaching in other teams, and I'm, I'm sure the New Zealand Rugby Union will make the right decision. It was giving absolutely nothing away there. Some will be coaching in New Zealand, Scott Robertson. Others will be coaching other international teams, Jamie Joseph. He's a smart man, isn't he? I love Eddie Jones. And I, <laughs> and I, I think it's great that he's coaching Australia, to be honest with you. Because you think of that about the first test match, that first bled is low. You think of the banter that's going to be going around, you know what I mean? He's wonderful at that, and I think he'll bring a bit of, bit of theatre to what we do. But he is he was all right in, say, that... Coaching is a high-performance game, you know, and at the end of the day, New Zealand Rugby Union, uh, England, Australia, their job is to win. You know, that's their job. And their role in that is to have the best people available to make sure they win. Then everything else becomes a lot easier. That's the happiest I've seen Eddie Jones in a long, long time. You think about it. He's back in Australia. He's got the sun on his face. He's got Stephen Jones off his back. And his bank balance is absolutely bulging from the money yet, though, they had to pay him out at the England Rugby Union. Two things for me, team. Two things. Both guys, John Hart and Eddie Jones, said there won't be distractions, and I agree. So I think we just forget about that. The players will be focused. The other thing they said is, um, you know, get the process right. And I think that's really, really important. If you get the process right, you'll get the right person. And like you said, Batesy, any of those choices up there are probably going to be pretty good. Mm. Well, there's still plenty more discuss on the breakdown. Stay with us here. We will talk Super Rugby Pacific Round in Melbourne. Super Rugby Opiki coming up too and that Artie Savia incident. Now they go wide. Brunt flings it wide. The Blues. Maybe with a chance out here. Colossi. Colossi around the outside. Willison, Willison, drawing in the defence, Willison oh. gets the pass away, and Paul scores in the corner. Tubic into the backs, now they've got some space and some numbers to burn, they must score, and they will. It's gone backwards, Willison around the outside, a chip and chase, and now the race is on at the back, the bounce, sets up the Chiefs have raced away. Connell moves it on, Blues have numbers here, they've just got to finish it, and they do. Shifting along Murray, and guess who? I shall let the anger! Tracks. Canadian lock forward to crown Matele. Gets the ball back home! Gets it away, Hini. Flooding the ball, Brooker. My God, self, she will! They're going to score, surely, are they? On debut, yes, she will! Autumn rain, Stephen Staley. Murray, she'll be hard to stop here. Very good tackle, Renee. But it's still on Nauru scores! And they take it quickly here and off they go. Brookham finding support. Holmes! Renee Holmes! Will she score? What a game for Renee Holmes! Super Rugby Opeki with two rounds in, two rounds from the semi-final. There is a semi-final and a final this year in Super Rugby Opeki. There's been some incredible action. Chiefs Manoa still undefeated, but coming off the back of the Women's Rugby World Cup, we wanted this competition to expand, to continue that momentum. Has it done that, JK? Yeah, I think it has. I didn't see the second game. I saw the first one with the Blues, obviously, and some great, great tries. Um, I think it's just the new rules um, that are having teams blow out even in the in the men's super but yeah I thought it was some outstanding stuff quite physical so if we've wanted to carry on the form I think it's there Batesy you agree yeah I think also you've got to you gotta, like, we're here to promote the women's game, but I also think we're here to promote the Black Ferns. You know, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to get um, a higher level of rugby in these girls, and that's what this format provides. You know, we've uh, minus the sevens girls, we've got the best woman in the country playing a little round robin tournament against each other, which is the closest thing you can get to playing test match rugby within your own country. So when you're having two bites of the cherry, I think it is successful. Um, in my opinion, at, at some stage, you know, I think it would be 
be great if uh, in the preseason the Blues um, went out and played a uh, game at Waitemata in the park there, and it was a wonderful occasion, you know, to get it out to the clubs and stuff like that. And I think that would be great for the local game. Yeah, I, I really love it. I like the idea of bringing your top players together at elite level competition, which has enabled it to go professional. Uh, what we saw, the skill levels, yep. the fitness, and they did have some of the sevens players in the mix last year, which I think, you know, having had any people like that there really would have rubbed off. But I, I love it. To me, the next logical step is let's look to, it, to bring the Australians and let's make some sort of trans-Tasman competition out of it, just heighten the interest of it even more, let it build and build and build. But as I say, you had a thriller there. Uh, yes, a bit of a blowout in one game, mm. but it's to me, it's doing everything that it set out to be. It's also about inspiring the next generation, isn't it? I just wanted to ask you quickly, TJ, you've got a young daughter. Does she watch this competition and want to play in it? She watches everything, mate, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> That's what it's about, though, isn't it? That's what it's about at the end of the day, inspiring young girls and boys to want to play rugby, to continue playing this wonderful game. Well, the women's show that premieres every Wednesday at 8pm with the one and only Laura McGoldrick. She's joined on the couch by uh, some incredible athletes we have in New Zealand. This was last week's show where Les Alda and Chelsea Semple talked about what it's actually like being an athlete, being pregnant, coming back from having a child as well. Very informative, very insightful program. Uh, Susie Bates will be on the couch this Wednesday as well. Time now to talk Super Rugby Pacific action from Melbourne. All six games, Super Round. Let's talk about it. All thanks to Neurofin and Chemist Warehouse. Well, it was a rough old night on Friday for the Highlanders, uh, but for the Crusaders, they just keep doing what they do without their coach, Scott Robertson, who was at home after uh, bereavement leave. So we send our thoughts out to you, Razor, and to your family as well. But David Arvelli for the Crusaders, TJ, was exceptional. That's important in a World Cup year when we have been talking about this All Blacks midfield. Yeah, and he made it pretty clear that's where he likes to play, which mm -hmm. creates an interesting scenario because I think they quite like what they got out of Geordie Barrett there last year and he's responding to that challenge. I think the other thing about that too, Batesy, was that I think he helped Richie Moonga. I, the fact that the forwards had a much gave him a much better platform, but I think... Moonga, with him beside him, looked a lot more in control of the ship this week. They looked a little bit like, and you never want to bag the Crusaders because they're at your own peril, but last week they looked a little bit off kettle. They didn't kick very well and they didn't have their, uh, they weren't synced very well, but I tell you what, they were certainly synced very, very well in this game on Friday. Um, if there was a hole there to run in, someone was running the hole, they were back to the Crusaders of old. Is that the difference that a Sam Whitelock has coming back in as well, his calming influence, JK? Oh, I just think it was a one-off last week. The last thing you want to approach is a hurt, stunned <laughs> Crusaders side. It's going to be a long season for the Hollanders, I think. Um, they, uh, they've got a lot of work to do, the Hollanders. So it's a great game to come back. I think the guys needed to step up. They did. And for me, um, the Havili-Barrett uh, discussion is a big one because we've been talking about a 12 that's got a kicking game, and both of them have. So it's going to be a really interesting one to watch. Highlanders conceded 112 points across the first two games of Super Rugby. Does that change at all with Aaron Smith? How big an influence can he have on results? Well, also, um, Ethan De Groot and Shannon Frizzell were yeah. missing there, and they need all their big guns, their big guns firing. But no, it's, it, it has not been a good start to the season. I mean, you couldn't ask... You know, you struck the Blues first week and the second week a wounded Crusader side. Uh, it's not going to get any harder than that, I would say. That's about the only thing I would say. Chiefs. Oh, true. Chiefs next week. Yeah. I'd, just say, on, I'd say one thing about the Highlanders. Is they're over in Melbourne now and they're going to Suva next to play. I hope they're going straight there and then they can get a bit of time together because they obviously had a pretty tough start to the tournament. They get a bit of time together, they get a bit of bonding, and who knows what can happen, you know? I hope they're going straight to Suva and spend a bit of time together because at the moment, it's a tough old start for them. Oh, that would be nice, wouldn't it? <laughs> Suva right now? I don't know if you need to go to Suva. <laughs> to be, hey, I'd be lying around the pool. <laughs> That's it. Auckland's not problem. too bad at the moment anyway. Uh, we've finally got summer. Uh, but while there was some amazing action on the field uh, over the weekend in Melbourne, one incident in particular has stood out. Adi Savia has found himself in hot water. He will go to the judiciary to defend himself tomorrow. Let's take a look at that incident. Oh, Adi. Ten minutes in the bin. Wow. You just got to walk, Adi. No, I can understand the fans are furious. 
around the gesture that I made, mate. It's just the heat of the moment kind of thing, you know. It's, it's 40. Usually that's out of character for me, so I put my hand up first and I apologise for that. It's just no excuse for me, mate. I've got to be better. Talk us through what happened just before half time. Look, uh, I, I, I didn't start it, but I, I most certainly love getting involved. Um, no, it's a, I think it's a great part of the game, just uh, getting the boys up and, and look, it's, it's, it's part of the game, you know. The gesture. Yeah, I was just, just meaning when I come on, I'm going to try and smash you. And it's a warrior game. You know, you're in there, you're ready to battle, you're trying to smash each other. And um, there was a bit of banter going on and, you know, got the best of me. Um, don't worry, my got off the field and my old man called me um, and kind of grabbed me off. So that's a lesson learned. Kudos to Adi Saber for coming out front footing it and apologising immediately after the match. And he's been told off from his dad. Is that enough, JK? Where do you sit uh, in this argument? Was it right making that gesture or was it not? No, a total mistake from Adi, but he fronted up straight away and apologised. It should not go to judicial, I don't believe. Um, we want to send a strong message to the kids, but that was it. I'm sorry, I made a mistake, I wasn't good enough and I need to get better. That's what you want from your leaders. Um, we need to be a little bit careful too because sometimes we make those gestures when we do the haka as well. So I don't know if there was, if he was actually, you know, it, like you said, it's warrior. So did he make a mistake? Yes. Do we want to see it in our game? No. But he apologised and did it really well. So, Can no. I ask you a question, JK? I thought you were a blues man. Because the Hurricanes are playing the Blues next week, so one week suspension wouldn't be too bad for them, would it? <laughs> yeah, two weeks. We all know what a champion player he is, what a champion bloke he is, and I very much doubt that he, as Reese Hodge suggested, that he was actually threatening to kill anyone. The fact of the matter is, though, that image was not a good look. It does not leave a lot of room for interpretation, hence uh, he's been suspended. It's going to help him that he apologised. Uh, and, the, you know, the judiciary's been pretty lenient. Look, it wasn't a smart thing to do. It was in the heat of the moment. moment. And I've got to say, too, I actually love the fact that things got feisty. Oh, right. That when that sort of scrap, I mean, by modern standards, it was a scrap erupted before half time. I thought, this is great. That they, you know, the, they're firing Good up game, this. Yeah. yeah. I agree with you, mate. Like I, like, I don't condone what he did, but it was the heat of the moment, you know what I mean? It's, like he said, it's a warrior game. Sometimes the things get past of it. But I tell you what, it was awesome to watch. Mm. I'm not saying when you go back to the old days, but, you know, a bit of push and shove, a bit of passion, that's what you want to see. So, from my point of view, he made a mistake, probably shouldn't have done it, but to me, move on. You know what I mean? He's apologised and um, it's a heat of the battle thing and he got it wrong once. Move on, don't worry about it. It will be decided for Adi Savia tomorrow at the judiciary whether or not he will miss any game time for the Hurricanes. Uh, talking about the Blues, you want him to be missing next week. <laughs> they weren't so lucky against the Brumbies, going down by five points. This was a crazy match. 45 points scored in the first half absolutely zip in the second half, JK. How good are these Brumbies, or were the Blues a little bit off their game? Oh, the Blues were off. I think the Brumbies played to their strengths, took them to set piece. But when I, you know, there was too many errors from the Blues. They missed a couple of key opportunities uh, late. And so they probably didn't deserve to win that one. I think it's possibly a good thing. Um, it looked hot, it looked like they were struggling, no excuses, but the Brumbies, you cannot let them dominate the way you, that, that they want to play, TJ. So the yeah. Blues, I thought, how many errors, how many penalties, yeah. it was it was a stop-start game, and when you do that to the Blues, they don't enjoy it. And if you're going to play the Brumbies anywhere west of Farewell Spit, you know, there's a few things that you need to get right. Firstly, you do not want to be giving away lots of penalties, because they will boot the ball down to your corner of the field, and that, that line-out drive, even though they were allowed to put a blocker in front of the jumper. I don't think we're allowed to do that anymore, but it's very, very effective. Uh, you can't be kicking the ball away. I thought the Blues kicking game, Batesy, was very average. Uh, they just kicked the ball away to them, you know, too many times, and also their support of the ball carrier. They just keep getting beaten at the breakdown. Oh, I agree with that. I agree with the second one, mate. I, th I think the Brumbies, they want to maul you, and they want to be ferocious at the breakdown, and both sides of the ball uh, on the counter ruck and defensively, they're both going ha hammer and tongs at it, but the Brumbies want to, I don't know the stats, but I'm going to say they got eight turnovers there, I would imagine, maybe more. So the Brumbies, I believe, did a little job at the breakdown on them. We've been talking about that All Blacks number 12 jersey. Well, Roger toivasa Shek was, of course, back in action. What did you think of him this week, JK? I thought he was very, very good in the first half. I thought exactly what I love to see him at 12, great feet. Um, if you have a look at this footage, he sort of goes on the outside, makes this break, and then he goes on the outside, the other side of the field. Um, a little bit quiet in the second half. Um, but, yeah, I think this is what we thought we'd see from him, so real big improvement. He might have been a match winner too because uh, they made a great breakout and 
I think Rico Ioane had the chance to set him up, just couldn't quite finish the job off. I think if they'd got the pass away in the right position, he could have been the match winner for them. I, I, I actually thought he was one of the Blues' best players. I thought he's Which might not be saying much, I don't know. Well, I thought he's electric, I really did. I thought I thought um, that when he was on the ball, he uh, looked like he had genuine pace. So I thought it's one of the best games he's played for the Blues. What I liked about it too was they gave him the ball a bit earlier, Batesy, and that's when he's dangerous. Like I don't think he's the type of player that we need to take it to the line and, and try him to do it late. When you give it to him early, he gets the opposition set and he can bring his feet into it. Well, every week on The Breakdown this year, we get one person to pick their Form 15. TJ, you had the honour of doing it last week. Yeah. Now you're here to defend yourself, or maybe to pick apart this week's team, because Mills <laughs> Muliaina watched every single game from the commentary box in Melbourne, so he was in a great position to pick this week's Form 15. Here is his team. Here's his front row. Joe Moody, who got penalised a couple of times, but then he recovered. Cody Taylor, who had a very solid game, and Tyrell Lomax there in the number three. Jersey, his second row, Brody Retallick and Sam Whitelock. So good to see these two back out there. His loose forward trio, Tom Robinson. And if you need any answers why, go and watch the highlights of that Blues match and see the try he scored. Outrunning a fullback, Dalton Papali'i uh, is his number seven. It was tough to pick between him and Sam Kane, but he's gone with Dalton this week. Adi Savia out the back as well. If we look at his backs, Brad Webber, Richie Moonga get the nod in the 19 jersey this week. In the midfield, David Harvelli, who he said Roger Toivasa-Shek was more explosive this week. He admits that, but Harvelli's kicking game was better and his combination with Richie Moonga. Rico Ioane said it and forget it. He loves him in that number 13 jersey. And his back three. Couldn't go past Caleb Clark, Celesi Rayasi and Sean Stevenson, who is making fullback his home this year, isn't he? That is Mills Moliainas. Form 15 for this round. TJ, we'll give you the first pick. Yeah. Since you weren't here last week, yeah. what do you think of that team? Are there any positions you'd change? I've been looking forward to that. This is the bit where we sit around and we bag the efforts <laughs> of someone who's been sitting there watching all the games all weekend That's like right. you guys climbed onto my team. Look, I'm going to make an admission, firstly, about last week, the team I picked. And right at the last minute, I changed my hooker. All weekend... You it, can't pull that out now, TJ. It was Toki Aho. We're a week later, TJ. Yeah. <laughs> and, and then I thought, you know what? Almua came on and, to me, changed the game. So I went for him. And probably this week, I'm now going to turn around and say I might have had Toki Aho <laughs> in this particular team. I can understand why he's gone for Cody Taylor because he was at the forefront of a very good forward effort. And I'm just interested. He's picked that midfield combination as well that we were talking about. Moonga and Havili complement each other so well. Yeah, don't disagree um, with the hooker. I think it's great for the All Blacks, both of them going at it. Really, really good for All Blacks. Um, yeah, I thought Roger was really, really good. I thought I'd probably put him in. And then I thought, actually, uh, Sam Kane was really, really solid. And possibly with Dalton going off late, he might have got the nod this week. But both going well. Looks good for the All Blacks. Batesy. Yeah, I thought Hoskins played pretty well too at number eight for the Blues. He carried the ball quite strongly. Um, I, I agree with him with Salisi Rayasi. He's looked really good, yeah. really good. Looks like he might have lost a little bit of weight or something like that. I've used the word with Roger, but I'll use it again. He looked electric, Salisi here. See, here he is here. Now that's um, he was uh, he was more or less try and stop me if you can. And we know he's got some really good silky silky skills as well. well there we go. There, right on cue. So I thought he was really good. So um, Mills, you might know what you're talking about after. Oh, buddy. <laughs> Full back, Sean Stevenson. Yeah, I mean, I just really, I've always liked him, and it was really interesting that they mentioned about his inconsistency um, and how he needed to improve that. So I'm actually watching that, and he has been yeah. consistent last year, consistent this year. So yeah, he, and, and I think we're seeing a different type of player. We need a bit of silky skill, step, bit of pace. I, I was just wondering about Mills Mulioni going for commentator of the weekend with Sonny Bill pulling out the guns in a T-shirt. Uh, so. You talk about Stevenson, to, to me that was always the question, that he'd do a couple of really brilliant things and then maybe he might make a little bit of a mistake or a gaffe or something like that. And I think he's worked really hard on that. Um, wh what he brings is, you know, we know about the finishing ability, the talent. The other thing that he's got, he's got that thunderous boot. He is one of the longest punters on the game and he has certainly brought himself into the all-black discussion. So here it is, here it is again. I think we've got something to show you. Mills, this is the new look oh. for commentators. <laughs> that means that I won't be going to any games in the near future and you need to go back to the gym, Mills. So there we go. Oh. He's always been rocking the styles, old Sonny Bill, eh? And just getting a tan while sitting there in, what, 33 degrees in Melbourne this weekend. 
that's how the hot it was. players felt it. Yeah. Can we just mention uh, one other player uh, who was in Mills Molina's first 15? Tom Robinson, scoring tries like bags. What about that guy? Yeah, and, and Tom's one of those players that I think gives you a little bit of X factor. We've spoken about him for the last couple of years, mm. Bates, so you probably know him a bit better than us. He's one of those guys that can play lock, play loose forward, and he's really, really athletic. Um, but his would probably be consistency, you know? If he can play, not get injured, and play 80 minutes, um, he, he, he could be an outside chance for the lock, loose forward cover. It is tough, you talk about him getting injured, and he does get injured a little bit, but the reason why he gets injured, a little bit like Ethan Blackadder, they're not holding anything back, <laughs> you know what I mean? They're out there for, if they're out there for 40, they're giving you everything for 40. They're out there for 70, everything for 70, and you know, he's a, he's a guy that, follow me kind of thing, and when you play like that, sometimes you tend to pick up a few injuries. And that number six, to me, it's still one of the, there's still a situations vacant sign there. I don't think anyone's really grabbed it. In fact, that, you know, there's still talk of maybe um, Scott Barrett filling that role, because it's something he did pretty well, but, you know, with performances like that, he's, he's certainly going to, you know, have everyone paying attention, isn't he? Very good, very good. Well, every week across Super Rugby, we look at the best play of the week, but in this case, it is the best player, all thanks to Musashi, our power play. It's David Havili, and how could it not be? Because he was simply brilliant this weekend, JK. Yeah, I mean, he's, he's a class act, isn't he? And the thing I like is... Um, I'm going to keep talking about it all year. What are we going to do at 12? What are we going to do at 12? Can he play 13? But the thing I like about him, and this might be the deciding factor, is when he is outside Richie Moonga, I think he's got a bigger voice and Richie can use him for his kicking game. So he was outstanding. Um, and, you know, he's only been playing there a few years, really. So he's pretty much nailed it. Mm. You enjoy his performance over the weekend, TJ? Yeah. I mean, he's a, he's a quality player, quality person, David Havili. He brings leadership. Uh, he's made it clear, as I said before, that this is the role he wants to fill. I think he's in the picture. Yeah. And, and what he does, he brings that versatility as well. He can play two or three different positions. So even if, and, and the feeling I get is that they, they definitely see Geordie as the guy that is the front runner for the 12 jersey, he's very much going to be part of the setup of this team. Why is that, TJ? You think because he just brings a little bit more of a manonu? He runs a bit harder, he's a bigger man, he can get you over the vantage line with a bit of force rather than the. As Graham Henry would say, JK, all of the above. All of the above. Yeah, I, I agree. Batesy, we're probably, since Ma'a, we want someone that's also just given the ball and he's going to get you over the And that's what Geordie brought. I mean, think about all his other schools, right? Yeah. Good kicking, but that's what he brought last year. It's interesting to say that because, and, and probably a guy that straight out of the game line left a couple of years ago, Leo Mape. You know what I mean? And people would say, oh, yeah, but he's a little bit one dimensional. But the thing, if you're one dimension, is awesome. <laughs> Why do you need a second dimension? You know what I mean? Like, you're do this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to pass the ball to Lamape and he's going to smash over the gain line. Good luck. And then everything flows from there. If your one dimension is awesome, that's good enough, you know? That is your Musashi plow play for the week. I love how you described that available. Sounded like an ad, didn't it? <laughs> <laughs> it was a Musashi ad. It was a Musashi ad. Thank you so much for your sponsorship on the breakdown. Couldn't do this without you. Well, still plenty more to come on the show. We talk Six Nations, the Sevens in Vancouver as well. But first, if you missed any of the magic moments from across the weekend, we've got you covered. is blown by Angus Gardner and Damian McKenzie gets us going. Oh, and an intercept straight away. Oh, that's the quickest try of all time. Don't line anyone up. Moonga on his own, still going. And he finds Drummond. Hands it off to Havili. They must score here, and they will score. Great try by Fergusburg. Left foot step, left foot step, three of them, and Sarah Irini 
with the last touch of the ball. Stacey Walker for the back friends. Is it on the right edge? New Zealand has somehow got the ball back their way. And what's Michaela Blyde going to do? Swerve and change and fend and stumble and score. New Zealand will be led out by Kelly Brazier in her 200th match. Blyde, Blyde's got Woodman outside her. Instead, she changes direction, shot and swerve and weaving. And the balance is beautiful for Blyde once more. Just over a minute to play. Canada looking to tie us up. Pharrell and Kirsten Cooper. No, my hockey, my welcome back into the breakdown. It may have been by the barest of margins in the quarterfinals, but that is all you need. A win is all you need. And our girls are now through to the semifinals of the Vancouver Sevens. Most importantly about that quarterfinals, they have now qualified for the Olympic Games next year. That is what this year is all about on the Seven Series, TJ. I don't think there was too much doubt that they were going to make it there. I mean, it's amazing that as the gold medalist that they have to qualify again. But, yeah, look, they haven't had it all their own way. I thought Canada put up a really great scrap but the, the great thing about this team and there's just so much leadership there's so much experience they never seem to lose their call cool, and they always seem to be able to fight their way out of a tight spot well one thing i've quite enjoyed about them too is that they're starting to look to the next generation as well you look at the tournaments that they've played oh. they haven't just gone for the tried and tested the whole time you know early on there they had the youth coming through and yes they didn't win all the games but at the end of the day they're still doing really well as you mentioned they've qualified for the olympics so job done and they're starting to build that next tier so the success that, they ha that they've had can hopefully from our point of view keep going. Yeah, Georgia Miller. Oh, oh, outstanding. Out it just brings such power to the game. Yeah, um, yeah I mean a bit tougher for the, uh, the, the men's though uh, JK, the All Black Sevens. Uh, the, the Aussies have they've, they've made a good bounce back in the Sevens game haven't they? Yeah, the, yeah they have um, the, but the Sevens are, are going pretty well. They're top you know, they're top, TJ. They've already qualified. Well, I think they're going to qualify. Um, I don't think they'll, you know, they'll, they'll do it. But the, the, the men's game, if you watch it a lot, you're having bad days. I mean, they had, you have a bad day. They have a bad game. Can't get the ball. I mean, they nearly lost. Um, they just won in the last minute, they're, you know, in one of the other qualifying games. But I, I think the difference between our male and our female game is our superstars from our 15s do go to the 7s. That doesn't happen in our male game, and I think it's uh, something we possibly need to look at. You know, can we um, have a few more crossover athletes? I think these athletes are great, don't get me wrong, they're winning it, so no, no complaints there. But also from the superstar, you know, we're going to go to the next year's Olympics, can we have that situation where guys cross over? But they would need to cross over mm. um, at the beginning of the year. Our Black Fern Sevens uh, play their semi-final against France tomorrow morning, 10.26am. I know you'll all be watching that one as well. And the Six Nations. It has been so exciting this year. The penultimate round is coming up next weekend and it is all to play for as well. Let's talk through these matches. JK, I know you're going to want to talk Italy. Italy taking on Wales. Wales desperately need a victory and your side has been going not too bad this year. Yeah, Kieran's done a great job. He always does. You know, he went into Benetton and he actually won the, the Pro 12 or whatever it's called. Um, and he's done a great job with his team. He's picked a whole lot of different guys. I mean, we're seeing a lot uh, different athlete coming through, not just the big normal Italian athlete. So, and Wales are in trouble. Talk about distractions. I mean, they don't know if one of their clubs is gonna be around next year. So there's a lot going on behind the scenes. But, you know, Gaddy's a smart man. He's been, uh, he's been put under pressure. And I think that he'll have to play incredibly well. Uh, you know, for me, um, the Italians can win against Wales, and if they do, I think it'd be great. The, the spark plugs, the fullback, he, he's brilliant. He's absolutely brilliant. And, and to me, he's taken this, uh, the Italian team from a side that you're often suspecting were, were, were trying not to lose heavily to a team that now actually goes out onto the field. And, and I think you know much more about this, but talking to the guys who've played in Italy, that the mindset is just such a big factor in Italian rugby. They're now taking the field, knowing that they can not only compete with these other teams, but they're, they're a chance to beat them. I'd, I'd give them a shot at beating Wales. Scotland take on Ireland yeah. as well, Batesy. Ireland in the box seat at the moment, but Scotland have been huge improvers this year. Yeah, they have. You mentioned Italy. They they ran Ireland pretty quickly, uh, pretty close, yeah. you know, for a long period of that game. But um, I really enjoy Ireland. Mm. I really enjoy watching um, Ireland play rugby. I think they're... Um, 
I think they're attack hell. They set up their attacking pods and they swing around the back and it's hard to count numbers. Defensively, I think, is outstanding. I think, to be honest with you, I think that Ireland, the way they set everything up, their attacking structures, uh, in my opinion, are second to none. The one thing that worries me about Ireland... Is that we may cross over with them in the quarterfinals? <laughs> well, yes, OK, that worries me. But if they haven't got Johnny Sexton, yeah. I'm not so worried. OK, OK. Yeah. Yeah. He looks pretty banged up at times, doesn't he, Johnny Sexton? He's really struggling to get through the games. But while he's there, he's such a galvanising presence, such a great director. And, of course, you know, they usually call it Le Crunch. Well, it's not Le Crunch this time because Ireland are the, are the team out in front. But England-France. Yeah, huge that, game. Yeah, and little setback for France last time round that we, we thought that this was a team that was on such a roll and to me are still the favourites for the World Cup, that's in, in, in my mind. But England now, this is a chance for Steve Borthwick to, to, to make a, a statement as the new coach of England. If he gets a scalp in this game, then, then suddenly England are right back into the picture. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting conversation because normally when you change the coach like they did, you know, got rid of Eddie Jones, brought Ian Borthwick in, like normally, normally you get a reaction. Yeah. But it hasn't been yeah. the reaction that I expected. It's been a little bit shaky and he's made some changes, take, putting Marcus Smith out. You know, I think France, so for me, for the first time for a long, long time talking about the All Blacks, we'll be going to a World Cup and we're not favourites. Yeah. And I think that's an interesting thing. Ireland, I agree with Batesy though, if they don't have Sexton, they're a different team. Mm -hmm. So for me, France is the best team in the world. And I think they will beat England and it'll be a real statement. They need to beat England if they want to go next year and say we're number one and try and beat us at home. The Six Nations has been anything but predictable though, has it? It's a great tournament. It's, it's it really a wonderful is. competition. Like, I'll be honest with you, that's on my, my sky. You yeah. know what I mean? That's what I use my sky for because it's a bit early for me. But you don't get up um, for these ones? No, I don't get up for these ones. <laughs> Fair but enough. Yeah, it is great. It is a really, really good competition. And it's also good, uh, it's good to, you know, to see the contrast in what we're doing at Super Rugby and what they're doing over there. So I enjoy the competition. Well, if you listen to Brad Weber on the breakdown last week, he said our players are now watching what the Northern Hemisphere sides are doing and copying it. Yeah. Mm. yeah. You cannot... I mean, the most frustrating thing about Ireland is, as we saw last year, they have this incredibly um, out-of-this-world organisation. Bates, and you'd love this being a forward, that they know exactly where they were going all the time. Very rarely do you get to turn them over. And so they can hang on to ball for long, long periods of time. And breaking that down is incredibly difficult. They will not, they will not throw a risky pass, Batesy. They will go to a ruck and recycle it. The thing that Sexton brings them is a great tactical kicking game and also the ability to run that game plan because it's not easy. As we saw the Blues in Super's round, you know, if you get a little bit out, you're going to get the ball taken over. Because he's a coach, run. isn't he? He's a coach on the field. And I, I had a conversation with Joe Smith last year and I said, I asked him, what's the difference between coaching here and coaching over in Ireland? And he said, the athletes in New Zealand are a million times better. But what they do in Ireland is they don't have the athletic performance, but what they do is if you send out detail, they will nail their detail. So you talk about their attacking stuff and they're always in the right place every time. They do not get it wrong. They will drill that role, drill that role, drill that role, and they get really, really good at being in exactly the, same, exactly the right place in exactly the right time. So their structures are second to none. Well, uh, not too long left on the programme, but before we go, I want to get your predictions. Uh, before we talk Super Rugby predictions, I want to talk news predictions because every week we've gone off air for the breakdown and more news has come out of New Zealand rugby. First, Ian Foster showed a tap to a couple of journalists he wanted to talk to, and then uh, last week after the show, of course, we had the big announcement that we will have a new head coach. What's going to come out this week? Is there going to be anything more? Well, I said that, um, for me, distraction is indecision. I think yeah. the New Zealand Rugby Union has done the right thing, made their decision, whether you agree with it or not, TJ, whether you agree or not, they've come out, made their decision, and they've said, I, I was hoping they're going to do it within 10 days. I think the only thing that there will be news about who's going to get it. So now, very quickly, we'll move away from Ian Foster and we'll move to who's going to get it. So that would be the news moving forward for me. Well, to me, I'm awaiting the outcome of uh, the citing, the, the judicial yes. hearing for Adi Savia. You know, the judiciary have been extremely lenient on players who have actually committed acts of foul play on other players in the last few years. So are they going to be lenient on this, uh, I guess, what was a, a, an implied threat 
to another player. Um, that's something I'll be watching. And have a pretty clean record as well. And, who has, and who's apologised, yeah, and all those, all of those things that we talked about before. Mm. So that's, that's going to be an interesting one to watch. I, I get a funny feeling there's going to be a bit of a kerfuffle, a bit of an outcry either way. Either way, yeah. OK, well, let's get your Super Rugby picks for round three then. The week coming up, uh, Hurricanes, Blues, thank you all. <laughs> Where are you going? I'm going for the Blues. They'll bounce back. Tell, tell us why. Oh, I just think, you know, they've, they've, gone, they've gone down the road to Dunedin and it's been a high-paced game. And then they've gone over to the Brumbies and the Brumbies have suffocated them a little bit. They'll, um, they'll regroup back together. And the Canes also like playing a high-paced game and I think that'll suit them. CJ, Hurricanes? Yeah. Um, look, I'm, I'm going to pick the Blues to bounce back. I just, I, I'd probably want to wait until I see a, about a couple of injuries potentially in the team, but... Uh, you know, the Hurricanes, I, I, I love the way they're playing. Blues bounce back. I don't know if we need uh, an answer for the <laughs> KK. We know the answer. <laughs> He's going Blues. <laughs> Round three is going to be an absolute cracker. Great to have you joining us for the breakdown. Great to have you two both back on the show as well. Thank, Thank you. you so much, and we'll see you next week. And Damien McGinty gets us going. Oh, and the set straight away. Oh, that's the quickest tie of all time. Line and he went up. Moonga on his own, still going. And he finds Drummond, hands it off to Havili. They must score here, and they will score. Great try by Fergusburg.